Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Shimshak, Senior Evaluation and Analytics Manager at BCT Partners and Assistant Professor of Biostatistics at the University of Kentucky. Today, I'll be talking about some research that I conducted with Dr. Brian Shore uh, from Chapin Hall and Paul Brilsky from the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Maryland. This research was recently published in the Children and Services Youth Review. It's called Using Latent Class Analysis to Identify Clinical Subgroups and Pathways of Youth in a Therapeutic Foster Care Program. And to start off, I'll talk about, uh, before I get into our research questions, I'll talk about our overarching goal. We were really looking for a way to create a repeatable process to model an organization's historical data to identify patterns of youth and their clinical trajectories. This model can then be applied to new incoming youth in order to better understand their needs and develop smarter treatment plans. So our specific questions were, were there subgroups of children in the Kennedy Krieger TFC program, their treatment foster care program, that could be identified by using latent class analysis using only their initial intake data? And we chose their initial intake data to really look at sort of the youth from a, a pre-treatment viewpoint. So which kids are presenting with similar uh, clinical issues and, and can we find groups of them? The second question that we had were once we found these subgroups, were there clinical pathways of change? So looking at needs change over time, um, are, there, are there changes that we could identify that would inform treatment and service planning? So many programs will focus on an aggregated average status of those that they serve. And averages in general can be a useful concept if you're measuring a single dimension, say like height or age, but it can skew our understanding when those, aggregate, when those get aggregated over multiple dimensions. Um, and so if you're, you're putting a whole bunch of averages together into some sort of like universal measure, that can sometimes lead to creating these sort of one size fits all approaches. And our purpose was to offer a person-centered alternative that would allow a program to mass customize their approach and tailor their services to meet the needs and strengths of specific groups within their population. So the setting for this study was there was, we looked at 175 foster care children admitted to Kennedy Krieger Institute, their therapeutic foster care program between January of 2010 and December of 2018. The Kennedy Krieger program, it's a treatment foster care program that serves children uh, and youth that are zero to 21 years old, who may have emotional behavioral disorders, complex medical conditions, and may also have developmental disorders. And just to uh, define treatment foster care, it's basically a family-based service delivery approach that provides individualized treatment for children and their families the, the, the key takeaway here is that these are, are trained parents um, who are supervised and supported by qualified program staff. So as we get into the methods, uh, the CANS assessment, so this is the Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths tool. This was used to assess kids at intake and periodically uh, throughout their time in the program. As I mentioned, we use latent class analysis to uh, find clinical subgroups of youth based on their needs and strengths at intake. And again, this was that pre-treatment sort of view of these kids. And latent class analysis is a measurement model where individuals can be classified into mutually exclusive and exhaustive groups based on their response patterns. So in this case, it would be their response uh, to the, the CANs. And finally, for the longitudinal analysis, we used random forest. So a random forest regression model was used to identify specific CANS items that were predictive of total unresolved items. So if we added up all of the unresolved CANS items on their last assessment, um, we regressed against that number to find are there specific CANS items that really seem to be highly predictive of a high number of unresolved items. And we'll, we'll dive into that more deeply here in just a second. This is a, an overview of the sample characteristics. Um, so you can see that the, there was quite an age range uh, with most of the kids falling kind of in the six to 12 age range. One thing that is of note is that roughly half of the population was African-American. The national average in foster care for, for African-American youth is about 23%. So that while this is 
well above that average. It is consistent in the state uh, within Maryland, which is where this, uh, where the Kennedy Krieger Institute resides. Um, so the race and ethnicity breakdown is pretty consistent with, with Maryland's overall foster care numbers. So the latent class analysis resulted in three groups that we saw. Um, if you look over on the left-hand side, the red chart there is showing, this is a box plot of total actionable items at intake. So this would be the number of CANS items, and they had over 40 some CANS items that we looked at. This would be the total number of CANS items that children were actionable on. So if you're looking at the red plot, this is what I meant by rolling everything up into a single average can be a little bit uh, confusing or not confusing, but it can skew the results. So we, we're looking at the whole population in one box and we're saying on average that dot, which is at 10, they have 10 actionable items at intake with a median of eight. But what the latent class analysis revealed is that we saw three distinct groups. So there was class one, which had mild neglect, impulsivity and medical issues, but in general, their needs were much lower than the other two classes, as you can see in the blue bar there. The yellow bar in the middle represents class two, which these youth were marked by developmental issues and chronic medical issues. And then class three had more of your classic sort of complex needs, low strengths use that you would see in a residential uh, or treatment foster care kind of program. And even at this breakdown, class two and class three have some what appears to be overlap. But if we break it down even further at the item level, what you'll see, and this is just a sampling of some of the items that we explored, but you'll see that the items are in different areas. So the way you would interpret this chart, we'll just take adjustment to trauma, which is in the upper left-hand corner there in the behavioral domain. The way you would interpret this is to say that kids in class one on, uh, that are, they're 5% likely to be actionable on that adjustment to trauma item. Kids in class two, very few of them, uh, only 2% would, would, would likely be uh, actionable on adjustment to trauma, whereas class three, almost half of the group will be actionable on that item. So that's how you can interpret each of these at sort of that row level. And what you see is kind of true to the summary that we just saw, class three has complex needs spread across multiple domains. Class one, you see kids with very mild needs, but some neglect, some medical issues. In class two, you can really see in the development domain there that most of them are actionable in those areas, either in cognitive and or in the developmental area. And when you go over to the medical side, on the right-hand side, you'll see both chronicity and impairment is very high for kids in class two. Uh, in addition, down at the bottom under trauma experiences, you'll see that medical trauma is also substantial for class two. Um, a little bit in class one, but not very much in class three. And neglect you'll see across all three classes. So this, this helps develop sort of a viewpoint where we can see three different groups, um, three groups that have clearly different needs. And you can imagine even in this relatively small setting, a one size fits all approach would not be appropriate. So to further examine how these kids function once they're in the program, we had 105 of these initial 175 youth, there were 105 that we had repeated measures for. So we ran a random forest regression on the total number of unresolved items. And we found these seven items that were highly predictive of having a high number of total unresolved items. So the seven items were social development, talents and interest, oppositional, adjustment to trauma, school behavior, recreational and interpersonal. And both for interpersonal and talents and interests, you'll notice these came from the strength domain. So these would be undeveloped strengths, um, strengths that kids have not yet developed. So, it, and again, the note that the analysis for the longitudinal was, was conducted only on 105. Those were the youth that we did have the repeated measures for. We simplified these seven items into uh, uh, change patterns. And the change patterns were simply um, developed in this way. So kids that tended to have moderate improvement were youth that never had two or more of these seven items. So they might have had one at some point, um, but they never had more than two at any given time. Kids that had the highest level of improvement, they had two or more of these seven predictive items at some point in their duration of care. However, 
on their last cans, they only had one or none. And the kids that saw the lowest amount of need reduction or improvement were the ones that had two or more of these actionable items at some point in time, and they continued to have two or more at their last assessment as well. So now we can take these change patterns, this moderate improvement, high improvement, low improvement, and overlay them with the classes that we discovered using the LCA. And this is kind of what we see in terms of, of change over time. So class one, our mild needs youth, what you'll see in the initial ever and last columns, these are their, their cans, needs, and strengths. So these are the actionable items on, on a can. So these are cans. The cans are scored from a zero, one, two, three scale. And this means that they have two, which means action is needed, or three, which means immediate action is needed. So kids in class one, in general, in the moderate improvement, you can see had very low needs. Their average needs at initial was two. Um, over time, those emerged to having at least you know five or more needs. But by their last assessment, we saw only 2.4. So that 5.3 to 2.4 results essentially in a 55% need reduction. Um, so that's how you would interpret that final column there, the need reduction. Kids in class one that were in the high improvement category started out with three. You can see there were many needs that were discovered along the way because they went up to 16.5. Uh, but by their last assessment, they only had 5.7. That's a 65% need reduction compared to the low improvement kids, which at initial and at ever look very similar to those high improvement kids. But you can see by, by continuing to have two or more of those seven predictive items, they ended up with a lot more um, unresolved items on their last can, seeing only a 26% need reduction. The good news for Kennedy Krieger is they're making progress on all of their cases but we are clearly starting to see where they are making more significant progress. The one that really stood out to us when we were doing this research was class three, the complex needs youth. Now they didn't have anybody in the moderate need improvement. Their, their kids all had two or more of those seven predictive items, which means they wouldn't have fallen into that moderate improvement uh, category. But notice the difference between those that had two or more um, and had only one or none by their last assessment, that's the middle line, the high improvement group, they saw an 81% reduction in need compared to those in the low improvement category where they only saw a 33% reduction in need. So this is an opportunity where Kennedy Krieger can go in and examine those high improvement cases to figure out what worked and try to understand why weren't they able to apply those practices to the low improvement kids and again, as we mentioned, this is model-based. So they would be able to run new kids through the model to figure out what class they're in and if they have two or more of those, uh, of those predictive needs. So in summary, we can leverage existing data, what I like to call your organizational practice wisdom, to identify groups of youth with specific needs and strengths at intake. We can gain deeper insights into their potential clinical trajectories. And then we can develop smarter treatment plans by connecting our known best practices to those that would benefit from them the most. And as an organizational sort of quality improvement effort, you can develop stronger program improvement plans that will amplify the strengths that you're finding while addressing the needs that you're finding in terms of what is it that's keeping you from getting these best practices to some of these kids in your program. I like to think of it as you're discovering who's benefiting from your business as usual, and let's not change anything for them, but who could benefit from some deeper research and understanding about your program and make adjustments for those youth. So this, this helps you identify key subgroups in your population and provide the services that will serve them best. So I appreciate your time. If you would like to uh, link to the paper, just scan that QR code. It'll take you right to the paper. If you'd like to learn more about how we're using these kinds of models to develop recommender engines and other types of analytical um, tools for, for folks across a wide variety of sectors, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks.